Hello and welcome to this next Flip Preaching video. My name is Andy, thank you for joining me. Um, we're going to look this week at the passage, as always, for the coming Sunday. And this week it is a lovely little neat uh, bombshell. It's Matthew 22, 15 to 22. And this is the first of a series of four encounters between Jesus and other people who are trying to kind of trap him and get him into trouble. So here, the people who are trying to uh, get Jesus into, into a trap are the disciples of the Pharisees. So these were the people who were concerned with ridding Jerusalem and Israel from the Roman occupation, but they wanted to do it by getting back to basics. They thought if everybody behaved and were good Jewish people, then God would look favourably on the nation again and free it of the Romans. So the Pharisees were all about the rules. If only people would uh, start behaving properly, then this, they'd get out of this awful situation with the Romans occupying their country. Also, he said, along with them went the Herodians. We don't know anything about the Herodians, actually. That's kind of got lost in, lost in time. So they go to Jesus and they try to trap him by, well, they begin by lots of flattery. They start by flattering him. Um, saying, you know, we know that you're sincere, you teach the ways of God in accordance with truth, that you don't care who you offend. So they, they throw at him a question which would have been a live question at the time for people um, who are Jewish living in, under Roman occupation. Um, is it okay to pay taxes to the Roman Empire? Um, the obligation was you'd pay a denarius, which was about a day's wages. We met that earlier with the parable of the vineyard and the workers. Um, and you had to pay that once a year. Now, this was a really live question because it, they thought it might unveil Jesus's um, position on the Roman occupation. Um, it, it'd be a way of making him put, make you know, if he said, yeah, pay your taxes, that's fine. He would be supporting this, this evil uh, occupying force. If he said, no, don't pay your taxes, that would get him into trouble with the authorities. So they thought this was a good way to, to entrap him. And Jesus sees through that. And he, he gives some quite specific details of what he wants them to do. He says, show me the coin who's head is this? Whose picture's on it? And what's the inscription? What's the title? Interestingly, Jesus didn't have the coin with him. He has to ask the, for the Pharisees' disciples to produce their own one. That's really important to, um, to see what's coming. Okay, so what would, have, what would have been on that coin, on the denarius, um, would have been a picture of the Emperor Tiberius. Um, Tiberius was the emperor at the time of Jesus. And the inscription going round the end, that's where it gets really, really important. It would have said Tiberius, son of the divine Augustus. The emperor before Tiberius, Augustus, um, was regarded as God. Um, so you worshipped Augustus. Um, so Tiberius, it says on the coin, is the son of God. That's what it said. When it said, whose picture, who, what's the inscription, what's the title? It said, Tiberius is the son of God. Now this, for Jewish people, was uh, the ultimate heresy. This was completely heretical. And therefore, it's really hypocritical that these people who are Pharisees are carrying the coin with them. Jesus didn't have the coin, but the Pharisees had one, um, which, is, which is interesting. It seems that they were, you know, on one level, superficially they were all about doing the right thing but they still had the coin with them so it was uh, basically the, the coin to carry a coin was to carry a graven image um, so a couple of old testament verses which are on the sheet here which give some of the background to this just gonna focus there hopefully i'm back um, in leviticus 25 23 it says the land shall not be sold in perpetuity, for the land is mine. The empire which had taken over the nation, 
taken over the land. That wasn't there forever. God is the ultimate owner of the earth, not the Roman Empire. So there's that in the background as well. This is only a temporary thing. And then in Exodus 20, it said, I'm the Lord your God who has brought you out of slavery. Um, God rescues his people from uh, occupying powers. That's what that's what the Egyptian slavery situation was. They were held captive in, in Egypt by a hostile foreign power and God rescued them at the start of the story. Straight away it says, you shall have no other gods beside me. You shall not make yourself an idol. So carrying a Roman coin with the inscription Tiberius son of God on it, obviously in Latin, but Tiberius son of God, that was effectively saying, you know, I've got something to do with this occupying power. That was having a God other than the God. And that's why it was so dangerous um, spiritually for people to, um, th to do that. They, they, were, they were breaking the Jewish laws. Side of all of that, we've got earlier in Matthew, Jesus said that you can't serve two masters. You can't serve God and wealth. So let alone the clash between God, the actual God, and the fake God, Augustus. Um, despite the clash between Jesus being the son of God, not Tiberius being the son of God, we've also got the clash between God and money. Um, so there's this, this, this little encounter reveals a really uh, deep choice that the people had to make. And Jesus neatly sums it up by saying, give to Caesar or give to the emperor what is the emperor's, give to God what is God's. He's saying that have nothing to do with the empire. Have a, you know, if you can get away with not carrying the coin, that's, that's the best thing to do. Have as little as possible to do with it. It's fake. It's not worth any of your attention. All of your attention and love and devotion should be to the actual God, the one who does own the land, the one who is God. Jesus is the son of God. Um, not, not, and none of these fake imposter Roman gods. And it says that they were amazed and they left. <laughs> so the question for us is, you know, what, how do we respond to that today? Because the question is still live. We're not under Roman occupation, but there are still many equivalents. So a few questions to think through. Firstly, what is our equivalent? We don't have the Roman Empire, but we have all sorts of other things which are kind of proclaim to be godlike, to sort out all our troubles, to, uh, to take all of our needs and to, to be the, the answer. So what are the other equivalents to the Roman Empire today? Fake pretenders to be God. Secondly, what graven images do we carry around with us? Either physical things or in our heads or in our, in our attitudes or in our culture? Is there an equivalent for carrying around a Roman coin saying this is the son of God? What do we, do we have any equivalents? And three, how do we respond in terms of our obligations to pay taxes? Um, you probably live in a country where you have to pay taxes to the state, and I'm not saying that's wrong by any means, but how do we, how do we balance that with this deeper, overwhelming obligation to give to God what is God's? And that's what all our attention, or most of our attention should be on. Do fill out your tax returns, but what does the, how does that, how do we get the balance right between the things that we have to do to be a, a member of society, but also recognising that deep down, overwhelmingly, our obligation is to a different kingdom. And finally, how's this good news today? Okay, so um, I love this little passage. It's got so much embedded in it, um, so much which challenges the way that, that we live. Um, I wonder what you think about it. I'd love to hear. Okay, we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.